Hello, this is a short video that introduces close reading, which is a methodology used in literary studies. So what is close reading? Simply put, close reading just means a careful interpretation of a text. It could be any text. It's usually a short text, um, a poem, a passage in a novel. And although I'm going to try and talk about what close reading is, what it feels like, maybe even some tips on how to do it well, the truth is close reading is something that you just learn by doing it, by practicing it, um, and then you know what it is. So the term close reading can refer to the practice of actually reading carefully, you sitting there scribbling all over the poem, um, you know, your brow furrowed thinking about it. It can also sometimes refer to the thing that you then go on and write, the kind of um, analysis of the text that you've been reading in that way. The thing that really discriminates close reading from a lot of other kinds of activities within literary studies is that you're not that concerned with secondary sources. You're not that interested in what other critics and theorists may have said about the text. You're really kind of uh, opening yourself to the text itself, letting it lead you, letting it teach you how it wants to be read. And close reading, although it's sometimes called a methodology, there's no kind of like step by step recipe. There's no formula that you can follow. Each text is going to be different and each text is going to require a different approach. So you may find that when you're doing a close reading, you are led on many different journeys to many different places. You will be exploring philosophical, political, ethical conundrums. You will be doing lots of background research. You will be going on kind of um, speculative flights of fancy. And that is all good. That's all great. That is an important part of the experience of reading and of close reading. Close reading does ask that we continually come back to the text. So we go on these kinds of voyages. And in the midst of these voyages, we remind ourselves to return to the actual words on the page. Um, and when English literature was a fledgling discipline in the early 20th century, there was a way of doing close reading, which involved asking students to analyze the words on the page without even knowing the identity of the author. So being really strict about the kinds of context that you had available. Um, I, I think you, you might have been allowed a dictionary, but you wouldn't have been allowed any kind of other access to secondary sources. Um, and, and the rationale there was kind of that the students could encounter the text uh, free of presuppositions, which is a silly idea, really. Um, although in contemporary close reading, the way we do it nowadays, that spirit of kind of keeping an open mind, of challenging our own presuppositions, our own assumptions and biases and expectations. That kind of stuff is still at the heart of close reading. Um, if you want to find out more about the early days, uh, look up I.A. Richards, look up practical criticism, which is another term for close reading, and new criticism is a term that's also relevant. But we don't do it that way anymore, except maybe sometimes just for fun. So when you are doing a close reading, focus on the words on the page, but also feel completely free to use whatever online resources that you need to build up background knowledge. For example, looking up unknown words, potential allusions and historical contexts. So what does close reading feel like? It feels different for different people. The answer varies and personally, I kind of wonder if maybe there are quite a lot of different interpretive practices that are going on under the broad umbrella of close reading. But for a lot of people, close reading a text feels like gradually building up a sort of theory or argument about that text. You come up with questions, you work out what you don't yet understand. You sift your own uncertainties from the ambiguities and equivocations that are actually part of the text itself. You try out different hypotheses to answer your questions. You look for evidence to support them or discount them. And gradually your theory gets kind of stronger and richer. And at the same time, the text starts to kind of squirm and magically metamorphosize before your very eyes. Um, some of the questions that you'll be asking will be quite basic questions. There'll be things like, 
is this word predominantly being used in this sense or in that sense? Is this word in the sentence modifying this word or that word? Is this word fulfilling the function of a verb or a noun? And those basic questions will kind of form the foundations of the questions that you ask later on and the kind of theory and argument that you build up about the text. So one of the things that close reading asks us to do is be courageous about backtracking sometimes. You may have invested yourself in this really rich, interesting reading and then suddenly realize, okay, hang on, that question that I answered earlier in one way actually could have an alternative answer, which would have a ripple effect for everything that I've been thinking about up to this point. So it kind of asks us to be courageous in having second, third, fourth thoughts about um, the reading that we've been building up. Um, I've said that detective work is another good metaphor for close reading. You're kind of gathering clues, you're trying out different scenarios, and you're especially interested in the anomalies, the things that don't fit, that don't seem to make sense yet. And detectives obviously are usually patient, apart from some of the kind of hard-boiled, hothead, maverick types. Close reading certainly does take patience. Um, it's about spending time with the text. It's about learning all the text's kind of little peculiarities and quirks, all its little ways and how they connect, and maybe even letting the text learn some of those things about you. So I don't know about you, but I am finding it quite difficult to focus on certain kinds of things at the moment. So maybe one way of thinking about close reading is as a kind of meditation, a kind of meditative practice. Um, although quite an unusual meditative practice where your, your mind is going to be kind of filled with thoughts and speculations. Certainly like meditation, close reading doesn't always come easily. Um, and it's something that you get better with over time, the more you practice it. I think it is something that's really worth practicing, something that's worth kind of acquiring as a skill set. And that's partly so that you can understand the conversations that are taking place in literature that are maybe not taking place anywhere else in society or in culture. And it's also partly so that you can learn those forms of attention and attentiveness and bring them to bear in all kinds of contexts in your life, not just in the reading of literature. It can really change the, the, the sort of being that you are as you navigate this world that is kind of awash with all sorts of different types of information. So Close reading can also be quite a creative activity. Um, it's your opportunity to say interesting, exciting, persuasive, compelling, imaginative things about texts to make those texts more interesting. It is possible, I believe, to read a text wrongly, to create a mistaken interpretation of a text. But I also think that texts give us tremendous opportunities to kind of expand and augment and elaborate and play with them in our criticism, to become collaborators in meaning making. Texts kind of always come to us in a sort of half finished state, asking us to, to engage with them and to transform them. Um, some people might disagree with both those points. So I've just said, be aware that close reading sometimes goes by other names, um, practical criticism, which I mentioned, close textual analysis, or just maybe textual analysis. And although we're talking about close reading here, I'm not saying that it's like the only way of reading or the best way of reading. Other kinds of readings are really important as well. Other kinds of reading practices, reading in a way that might feel faster, that might feel immersive in different kinds of ways, um, that's that's so important. That's an important part of being a reader and being a scholar. There's also something called distance reading, which means in, um, kind of invoking technological methods, digital methods in order to learn things about text at scale. So looking at a huge corpus of books that you wouldn't have time probably to sit down and read one by one, but using digital methods to discover things um, that are going on within the larger corpus. So in a moment, I'll show you two poems, which you can try out some close reading on. And here are a few tips when you do. Uh, Every little bit of text is important. Leave no word behind. Cherish tenderly every little word. Listen to every little word and assume that it makes some difference. 
that means confronting your uncertainties, not just kind of sweeping them under the carpet. So when we read, we always have some sense of a set of, um, whenever we read, we have some kind of set of assumptions and expectations. And the natural temptation is going to be to ignore things that don't fit with those assumptions and expectations. So from time to time, resist that temptation. Take a step back and ask yourself, what is it that I'm not looking at? What am I not paying attention to? Is there something here that doesn't fit with what I think and feel about the text at this moment? A uh, little practical point, if you've got access to a printer, a lot of people find it helpful to have a copy or a few copies of the poem um, or text and actually scribble on them, make some notes, get kind of physically, tangibly kind of inside the poem. Um, I said, third point, that there is no such thing as two ways of saying the different thing. Uh, sorry, two ways of saying the same thing. Assume that every word choice is correlated with some kind of significance, however slight. Imagine that there's no such thing as a perfect synonym. Close reading is often going to involve exploring subtext, nuance, tone, mood, register. And in the same way that like uh, grains of sand on the beach from a distance are all going to look very similar. But then when you actually zoom in and get your nose in, you'll see that they all have their own strange, beautiful, wobbly, um, shapes and sizes and colors and iridescence and glow. In the same way, imagine that every single word has its own subtly discriminated, unique set of characteristics. Um, I've said that thinking about the author's intention is often a distraction. And here, I'm not really trying to make a philosophical claim. There are a lot of very interesting discussions about authorial intention in philosophy and theory. Um, Michel Foucault wrote a very influential essay about the author function, Roland Barthes, The Death of the Author. Um, work about lived experience is also extremely relevant, but I'm not really talking about making some kind of grand philosophical claim here. All I'm really suggesting is a rule of thumb a kind of guideline or principle for close reading. And that is, in my experience, spending too much time thinking about, oh, okay, but did the author of the poem or text, did they really mean that? Did they really intend to do that? What were they thinking when they wrote this? In my experience, those sorts of questions tend to be distractions from actually concentrating on what the text is doing, what it's capable of doing, and they tend to be limitations and constraints. They tend to um, prohibit you from using your imagination and your critical faculties to their fullest extent. So although authorial intention may sometimes be important, and you know, I would totally encourage you to get involved in those philosophical and theoretical discussions, I'd also um, advise a, a wee bit of caution when thinking about authorial intent. Make sure that you always come back to the, to the words on the page and, you know, believe that sometimes the text is capable of saying and thinking and doing things that maybe even the author didn't realize. Um, a final point on this slide is your own gut reactions are important, but remember that you can transform your own responses to the text as well. So close reading may involve implicitly kind of praising or disparaging the text. And of course, your own reactions, your visceral, emotional, uh, intellectual associations, all of those reactions, they're kind of your basic data. They're what you have to work with, but they're not some kind of rigid, unchangeable fact. The ways that you love and or despise the text will shape your reading of the text, but those, um, you, but your reading can also give you opportunities to, to feel differently about the text as you go along. Okay, so just to finish off, I'm going to show you two poems, and I won't say much about them. See what you can discover about these poems yourself from, from the words on the screen. Um, I will say that I, I paired them together deliberately because I thought there were some interesting resonances. Um, this is Hurt Face by the contemporary poet Sophie Robinson. And this is Pancake 
by Leela Matsumoto, another contemporary poet. And I would suggest that you choose one of these poems, pause it, and then just spend some time with the poem. Spend, you know, at least 10, 15 minutes reading the poem, thinking about the poem, coming up with questions and coming up with possible answers to those questions. And maybe we will touch briefly on these poems again in a later video. Okay, thanks everybody, bye.